Hi guys, this is the Make Configuration Horror Podcast. Uh, thank you for listening to us on iTunes or YouTube, wherever you happen to be listening to us right now. Uh, my name is Greg Knox, and I'm joined, as always, by a woman who would definitely win first prize in any evil contest, our resident body count girl, Rhea Fend. Hi Greg, great introduction. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so right, so as this is the next show in our Visio Nasty series, so these are the 72 films a director of public prosecutions believed to violate the Obscene Publications Act 1959, um, Rhea has our usual disclaimer for the more sensitive listening right now. Yes, I have prepared the warning. Warning, the following broadcast may contain spoilers, extreme language, violence, and topics considered graphic or adult, not for those of a sensitive disposition. So on the show today, uh, we're going to be discussing films where we have a killer who sacrifices their victims uh, in the name of a god or indeed a goddess. Um, Now the most uh, well-known example of this on the Video Nasties list, and indeed the first film we're going to be discussing today, is Blood Feast. Uh, Now Blood Feast is also known as the Egyptian Blood Feast, Blood Orgy or Feast of Flesh, which I think is a pretty awesome name. And this is directed by Herschel Gordon Lewis, um, the godfather of gore himself. Um, Now, Herschel Gordon Lewis is not necessarily a well-known director um, to mainstream horror fans, but um, he is quite a well-known cult director of horror films, particularly gory horror films. Um, So his other films include 2000 Maniacs, the Wizard of Gore and the Gore Gore Girls. So you can see there's like quite a similar theme developing in like the titles of his films. He likes the word uh, gore, doesn't he? <laughs> he he really does love his gore. Now, this is the oldest video nasty on the video nasties list. Um, so this came out in 1963. And this was, um, I believe, the very first gore film. And Rhea, I believe you have the synopsis for this one. Yeah, the synopsis for Blood Feast, um, which is 1963 film is a psycho Egyptian food caterer who goes on a killing spree, killing various women in suburban Miami to use their body parts to bring to life a dormant Egyptian goddess by the name of Ishtar, whilst a very inept police detective tries to track him down. So what we have, and this is very interestingly linked to one of our previous films, this is another film about a man who murders lots of women that was written by a woman. (laughs) Um, how do you feel about this? So all these women writing all these films about women, other women being killed. Um, it's interesting because I like this film for certain reasons that I feel like it makes sense now that there's a woman that's written it or styled it. Because one of the, the notes that I made after I watched this film was that I really love the 60s style, um, the sort of bombshell look, um, which you know that I, I enjoy. And I think that does kind of show the the woman's touch. Um, so I didn't I didn't realize like who had written it when I watched this film, but it makes sense now. And yeah, I like it. I mean, why not? Why not have a woman write that lots of women are being killed? It's a common theme in horror films. Yeah, although interestingly, it wasn't very common in 1963. So God knows what people must have thought about it when they first saw it. So if, if you're used to sort of space aliens or monsters killing people. I mean, people kind of completely lost their shit when Peeping Tom and Psycho came out, more so in the case of Peeping Tom. So, yeah, you've got sort of people actually having body parts physically removed and pretty cheap-looking gore, admittedly, by modern eyes. But, yeah, back in those days, watching in a drive through probably, <laughs> God knows what everyone must have thought. Uh, I just feel like, historically, females portrayed as the weaker sex, damsel in distress and... Um, inevitably being the victim because of that, um, but done in kind of a glamorous way. I don't, I don't see the harm in it, but I think back then, part of it being banned as a video nasty, it might have been down to those undertones, as well as the violence and the gore and everything. Okay, I mean, you've said that you like the film. Now, um, I've actually seen this film three times, and <laughs> <laughs> this one not really by choice, I have to admit. So the first two times were not by choice, this one more uh, for research purposes, let's put it that way. And <laughs> I have never really enjoyed it any of the three times that I've watched it um, for various different reasons. So it's pretty cheap, although not as cheap as some of the other films that we're going to talk about on the show. Um, the acting performances are very wooden for the most part. <laughs> Some n- really not great acting in there. Um, 
Although I've got to say, of all the performances, I did love the killer's performance. So the actor who plays Fuad Ramses, he's unbelievable. Absolutely <laughs> unbelievable. Have you seen Troll 2? Yeah, what a fantastic, so his, his fantastically acting, bad film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's oh it's definitely it's when they say it's the best worst movie of all time they're not wrong um yeah but his acting is exactly the same as credence eleanor gilgood because he talks like this <laughs> when he's speaking five thousand years old <laughs> yeah when i say i liked the film like i i enjoyed how bad this film was it was bad good but they did have a lot of um you know, good qualities to it. Like I say, I like the visual styling. Um, the killer's eyebrows were something else. <laughs> oh yeah, they're amazing. Like they must be fake, surely. I was fascinated by them, and the they basically put talc in his hair and in his eyebrows, which are dramatically <laughs> drawn over to make them very big and kind of menacing looking. But it just looks so comedy. Um, but they added talc to make him look aged and or creepy. I don't know, but. You can you can clearly see it's talc and it is cheaply done, um, very bad cheaply done special special effects which did amuse me. But then at some points some of it was quite a good effort, so I quite enjoyed um, how it was cheaply done. But some of it did look a little a little realistic and a little bit gory. And yeah, it's not to be taken seriously this film, but I think like it is great to see sort of how things have developed in horror over time and. And this one stood out. I enjoyed it because it was quite bad, but at the same time, there were qualities that I really liked about it. It's quite charming. Yeah, it does have certain charms. I'm not going to lie. And yeah, it would be very, very influential. Obviously, it'd be influential pretty much in in either directly or indirectly on every other film in this video nasties list, pretty much from start to finish, especially the low budget ones. Yeah, um, I see what yeah. you mean about. Um... The amount of gratuitous nudity in this, considering it was written by a woman, is is something else. So, <laughs> well, um, so let as you are indeed our resident body count girl, and this is a body count movie, uh, no mistake about it. Um, so let's go from the very very first death, which is right at the start of the film itself. Um, yeah. So I've totaled up six for this, which I was surprised about. Possibly seven, but I'm gonna say six, and we'll talk about why. Mm. So we have our first death, which is a woman in a bath. Yeah, so there's a blonde bombshell who gets into the bath and um, our killer. I think feel like what's unusual about this film is that the killer is revealed straight away. Like there's no build up, just kind of straight in there. He goes into the bathroom with his evil eyebrows and... <laughs> um, uh, he hacks off her leg. Yeah, which is pretty impressive considering now a lot of these murders aren't really very realistic, admittedly, but they're pretty impressive considering it's a man with a limp and he, I'm guessing he must be quite old as well. He's got the strength to like hack a woman's leg off. Yeah, he's uh, moving pretty fast for a guy who's like, um, you know, technically he's he's disadvantaged with his legs, isn't he? Yeah, absolutely. So um, what he's doing, so as you mentioned in the synopsis, so um, the plot of the film is he is taking body parts from these various different female victims and he, what he appears to be doing is putting them in a giant pot and stirring them and there's smoke coming out of the pot in that sort of very cheesy sort of vampire ride at Chessington sort of way and um, yeah, he's uh, sacrificing them to the Egyptian god Ishtar who, if he kills enough people, I assume he believes that they Ishtar will come back, I guess? Yeah, I think so. It's almost like he's taking enough parts to rebuild her, in a way. Like, you know, like some, Frankenhooker. Some that. Yeah, that's what I thought first, that the, the plot was going to be. Now, that would have been impressive in 1963 on such a low budget, how they would have achieved that. Exactly, and a, a key indication of the low budget is I really like that bath scene where she gets killed, where the blonde dies. Um, but the bit with the the bit with the eyeball at first, I think, is it a knife that he's got? But he sort of like puts it into her eye, and yes, the effect is just so bad. It literally looks like somebody's put plasticine over her eye and then painted it red. <laughs> yeah, or literally just covered her, her eye in red paint. And it appears that he's taken out a chicken kebab out of her. <laughs> but the the leg part, I didn't mind. I thought that actually that was sort of semi-convincing and 
I, you know, I thought that 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 was okay. It stood up, but the the eye was just ridiculous. Made me laugh so much. <laughs> and then um, <laughs> we have the great scene where uh, the mother of uh, Suzette, who's the main female character, um, goes to um, Mr. Fuad Ramsey's shop because she wants to have an Egyptian feast for her daughter because she's studying Egyptian history, which is <laughs> um, really coincidental if you think about it. Very that, appropriate like, for the plot. Hey. <laughs> Our 5,000-year-old Egyptian feast that hasn't been served. <laughs> which is when we get the amazing acting from Fuad Ramses. Yeah, cue wooden acting, I was going to say. And at no point, by the way, is the mother really suspicious that you've got this guy with these really, really sort of intense eyes sort of talking in this very sinister way about having a feast. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I, unbelievable. I, I sent you... Um a still of the screenshot when I when I was watching this film and I'm going to post that on our Facebook and Twitter so you can just see the eyebrows. Oh yeah, yeah, I so said the eyebrows are amazing. It looks like someone's uh, super glue caterpillars to his forehead. <laughs> amazing. It's very like uh, Cara Delevingne-esque. Yeah. Maybe that's where she got the idea from. It's possible that she's been inspired by that or maybe some uh, makeup YouTube tutorials. <laughs> Mm, exactly. Um, so um, after the first death, um, we have an amazing newspaper headline that I'm sure is very realistic and would have happened back in the day. Just the simple headline, legs cut off. Oh my God, I picked up on that too. I loved it. I was just like, that is amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. And um, who is it? It's one of the detectives or somebody says, uh, we're just working with a homicidal maniac. That's all. <laughs> Yeah, now the police officers in this film, particularly the main police detective, is possibly the most inept detective I've ever seen in any film ever. Like, the guy is just so dumb. It's like, I know obviously they can't solve the case in like the first 15 minutes, but honestly, like, the, they say, like, throughout the film, oh, there's no clues. You've got no idea who this guy is. Where it's like, oh, hang on a minute. That's fucking ridiculous. How can you say this? You go to, like, lectures with your girlfriend about, like, Egyptian history where they explain, like, you know, the blood feast to this god Ishtar and there's a, you know, girlfriend is having an Egyptian feast done for her by an Egyptian caterer who looks really sinister. Yeah. You don't know what's going on. Yeah. Well, the, the main actor as well, to go back to the scene where she asks for the catering for her daughter's birthday and she says oh i want something unusual and he's like what would you consider to be unusual <laughs> so brilliant an egyptian <laughs> feast dun 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 and like to say there's no clues there's this there's this book that keeps appearing all the way through with the title ancient weird religious rites which i, <laughs> I found absolutely genius and it's I like oh that. yeah that's so funny i wonder what's inside that then hmm Mm. Is it is it weird, <laughs> perchance? I love how it's called ancient weird religious rites. Yeah, <laughs> specifically. What, what about the normal ones? You know, we've got like weird ones, but what about the normal ones? <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, after our lovely newspaper headline of legs cut off, um, we skip to a scene which happens in every slasher movie in the 80s where you've got a couple um, trying to neck on the beach in the dark, as you do. Yeah, absolutely. They're going to get done in. Like, if you're having sex on the beach, prepare to die. <laughs> mm, exactly. As if Scream hasn't taught us anything already. Um, and then um, we've got our second killing, which is the woman apparently having her brain removed. Um, yeah. Again, with very, very unconvincing sort of uh, gore special effects. Yeah, I didn't mind that effect. Like, with, with the leg one, like I said, um, the eyeball was, was really crappy. Um, the leg was looked fairly realistic, but the way that he was conducting the knife action was just too gentle for me. It was like, if you're going to hack it off, hack it off properly. Come on. <laughs> You've gone exactly. to the trouble of doing your eyebrows with this. You can at least, you know, put some effort into the hacking. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, with, with the, the brains on, he sort of appear, they kind of hide it, don't they? And he, he appears to do something and then he scouts her and her brains are sort of spilled on the beach. It does make you wonder, like, how soft her skull is that he's able to access her brains, like, that easily, just with a knife. You know? Yeah, very easily. Like, just opening the tin of beans, isn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> like, the the bit that um, sort of grated on me in that scene, even though it is obviously really bad good, so it's highly amusing, um, was the, the guy. So he was, like, trying to persuade her to have sex with him. And she's like, oh, no, you know, not now. 
And then he's like, oh, that'd be really great. Come on. So she's like easily persuaded. And then he's present while she's being killed, but it's just all really weird. Like he do, he kind of gets away with a graze to the head and he has like a bandage on. And then he's gone all kind of do lally and he's blaming himself saying, oh, I made a stay. It's all my fault. It's all my fault. But it's just kind of weird how he was there the whole time and he escaped with just like a nick to the head. So that kind of, that annoyed me quite a lot. It was like, what? Yeah, which he managed to sort of just cover up with a bandage. Uh, and then we get um, him overacting to sort of balance out all the uh, underacting that everyone else is doing. So he has to act really hysterically. Where it's like, ah, la, 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 like all that kind of stuff. Yeah, talking gibberish. Yeah, it did great on me a bit that, but it is quite funny. <laughs> And then we have one of the many scenes in the police station with uh, the detective and the, the captain who loves banging on desks. That seems to be what he does when he's angry for the whole film, just bangs on a desk. And it's like, how can we not know who's doing all these killings? And it's like, well, we've spoken to the girl's parents. The girl had lots of friends. Like, all these girls in these films have lots of friends, and they all are apparently part of a book club that this guy, again, the detective is so shit, so inept, he hasn't worked out. That's actually the key to what's going on. <laughs> Yeah, it's ridiculous. Even though, like, as a viewer, the murderer is, you know, apparent right from the beginning. They're just taking so long to realise what it is that, you know, it's... W- watching the, the deaths is fairly entertaining, but there's no real sort of mystery or reveal a- about anything here. It's just all quite, you know, blatantly obvious with some very stupid detectives missing the point. <laughs> And then what we have, um, is it the third death at yeah, this point? Um, there's also there's a blonde in a hotel and he goes in there and he cuts a tongue out, which is um, not incredibly realistic. It's, it's quite drawn out. It's not done too badly. No, it's probably the most famous death in the whole film, I would say. And it's kind of effective because, although it's not obviously realistic that like someone would be able to rip out your tongue just with your bare hands that just yeah that's you'd have to be ridiculously strong to do that um but yeah it is kind of effective i suppose she kind of pretty original yeah it's quite original there's a lot there's a lot of blood which you can tell is fake like it doesn't really simulate blood that well it's very very bright red um (laughs) like red ink you might say um but she does a good job of, she's got her mouth wide open, she does a good job of like hiding her tongue, like presumably in the roof of her mouth, and it's shot at a particular angle, so it does look quite sort of, you know, um, freaky and weird. Um, so not, not a bad scene, quite like that. I think I still prefer the bath one, I thought that that was more entertaining. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're both entertaining, I suppose, in their own ways. Mm-hmm. And then, well, so I did... after we've had our, our victim with the tongue cut out, um, we then have uh, the scene where we've got our really inept police detective and Suzette, who is the main female character, who is played by Connie Mason, who was actually a Playboy playmate, which is probably why she's in this film. <laughs> probably not for her acting ability, let's put it that way. Uh, although she is very pretty. So at least she does have that going for her, um, where we uh, they sit in this lecture to do with the Egyptian gods uh, and the blood feast that goes on. So all that sort of typical expositionary scene that you get in all these uh, body count movies. Um, and um, then we have, well, do you count this as the fourth murder? Um, I noted it down when I was watching it, but it's like more of a historical reference, so it's not actually taking part in the film. So I think we'll discount it with the total, because it would be seven deaths if we included this, but I've totaled it up as six. So there's the Egyptian ritual where it shows the heart being ripped out, which is um, part of his knowledge and motivation to what he's actually doing. But he's not just doing the heart, he's doing other body parts, obviously. Um, and I think it's it just plays a key part in explaining the plot, but also where the title came from. So, quite like that reference. Yeah, although it's not really clear if this is actually taking place in the present day, or if it's just a flashback, and they've happened to use the same actor who plays Fuad Ramses to play this, you know, Egyptian from... 5,000 years ago. Yeah, it, it like kind of looks like a flashback, the way that they cut the scene and then go back into, you know, like present day. Um, but it is sort of um, a grey area, I will agree. And then um, we have the cracking lines. So we've got Suzette talking to the detective where she says, uh, how could a race of people actually follow such a vile cult? And then he says, well, the ancients had many strange cults, honey. 
<laughs> so is that um, ancient Egyptians? Yes, the ancient Egyptians are cults, basically, <laughs> apparently. And um, it's interesting that like uh, this police detective who looks as if he's in his mid forties is able to get this like really hot, attractive young girl who must be like, I don't know if she's like 20, 21, maybe. I don't know how old she's supposed to be in the film. But yeah, they somehow end up together. I don't think any way that's realistic, but whatever. Yeah, so the so the ritual sort of flashback takes place, which I'm going to discount in the total. And then they're listening to the radio, I think, because um, he drives her out. Are they, do they go to a viewpoint or something? Yeah, they go to a, a make-out spot. As they always do in these kind of 50s and 60s films. Yeah. Um, so they would go out to their make-out spot, a viewpoint on the hill or something, all romantic. And then he sort of like listening to the radio. He's like, oh, you know, work calling again. There's been a killing on the <laughs> yeah, radio. fucking work. You know, all those killings. Like, what a selfish bastard. Yeah. Cause he's just hitting on his, his young lady. And, um, yeah, he hears on the radio that there's been a 23-year-old girl who's been... Um, severely hurt by the by the killer and she's at the hospital so they go over there so at that point i thought she'd already died but then they go and see her in the hospital and i think she speaks to them and she's got her face all bandaged up um and then she does eventually die so that would make death number that's death number four if you if you discount the ritual in the dream sequence okay um, and then after that, um, we have, again, like just very, very random scene. One of the things I find funny about this film is how um, Fouad Ramses is able to basically kidnap and kill these women, and no one seems to notice. Yeah. Even though, one, look at the guy. He looks really weird anyway. Two, he's <laughs> limping. Yeah. And, f- yeah, he just seems to be able to kidnap and, like, there's one girl, I think it's even the, ne- the next girl that he kills. He literally, like, knocks her out picks her up over his shoulder and just carries her away in broad daylight in the middle of a park. And no one bats an eyelid at this. I don't even think there's anybody around. Yeah, he, do, he does it with the greatest of ease, considering he's a physically disadvantaged man. And at one point, he tries to kill Suzette, like just by wandering into her garden just while she's there with a bunch of other people. And obviously he gets, you know, obviously he can't do it. And he just wanders away and no one sort of stops the question, why is this guy here? What's he doing? He looks really suspicious. Yeah. Hang on, isn't that that man who like, so, you know, who's doing our Egyptian feast for us? Yeah, and they've not made the connection with the whole Egyptian rituals that they've been learning about. Well, yeah, exactly. It's a police detective who can't put two and two together, even though he's in the fucking lectures where they're talking about like Egyptian sort of feasts and rituals and like Egyptian culture and like yeah, he's there. Obviously, not listening. Sometimes the great thing about these horror films is that so how blindingly obvious the plot is, how straightforward it is, the title. Like it is just kind of as you would expect, and it did it did amuse me the way that it's laid out. It's quite obvious, and um, yeah, it's yeah. got a certain charm to it, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean the film is very simple. It's only seventy minutes long, and it doesn't really have any subplots apart from like you know the police detective and and the main girl. But other than that, there's it's literally pretty much exactly what it says on the tin, and. Yeah, there's like very, very little filler. So as a result, the film isn't actually boring. It is many films, but it boring it is not. Yeah, it's like I say, I kind of I expected to be bored, but then I enjoyed it. And if ever there was a time that you you sort of say something is um, paint by numbers of horror, this is probably it. So um, after this woman gets randomly kidnapped in broad daylight, um, he takes her back to his Egyptian food shop and he ties her up in the back and he starts whipping her. <laughs> which I believe is the reason why the film uh, may have been prosecuted by the DPP in the first place. Ah, it was that key point that did it, eh? <laughs> yeah, just that little bit of sadism there. Because um, when the film was released at one point, that scene was cut out or they heavily trimmed it. So, yeah, any th- like killing, fine. Whipping, no. They draw the line at whipping. <laughs> Sexual connotations, that's always the, the one to tip it over the edge. Yes, so um, they find her, so eventually the police do work out who the killer is, you know, finally, (laughs) even if it wasn't blindly obvious, and they find this girl, they find her dead body lying on a table or an altar or a slab or whatever it's supposed to be, 
and it's a pretty cool visual i've got to say or at least it was really cool until we did the close-up and that kind of ruined it mm-hmm. and that's so that's definitely five and yeah it's pretty good like um sort of climax of the film um and then yes we do get our climax where we do have our egyptian feast um which i'm not even sure what egyptian food even is to be honest um, can't say that I have ever experienced what Egyptian food actually is myself. Um, but if it's anything to go that I imagine it's probably a lot of meat. Um, so God knows what these people would have actually eaten had they actually had the feast. Um, and this scene is absolutely hilarious where we've got Fuad Ramses and we've got Suzette and he's basically trying to convince her to lie on the table so he can kill her. <laughs> so it's like, close your eyes. Yeah. And he does <laughs> no, it about no. three times and like she's yes. in this pink dress. She looks like Barbie doll. And she's like all giggly and like, all right then. Um, so he's yes. sort of trying to get her to do that. And she's just like, yeah. oh, this is silly, jumping down again. And then she's like, well, as you can see, my dear, I'm an old man. <laughs> so can you please do this for me? <laughs> and then at one point she even says, hey, you couldn't sacrifice me on this altar, would you? And he goes, oh, no, of course not. <laughs> I would never think of doing such a thing. A blatant lie. <laughs> she, oh, of course. She believes it. And he's kind of limping about the place, you know. She's just, like, non nonplussed by this. <laughs> and then, obviously, eventually, these people actually do get a clue. Or well, actually, no, the mother comes in as he's about to do it. <laughs> so this stupid idiot girl was about to get killed, and it's only because her mother came in and was like, oh, my God! And, and then... <laughs> Yeah, and then Fred Ramsey has to run, well, limp away. I was going to say run away, but he can't really do that. Yeah, he limps and away. Then, <laughs> and then the police kind of catch up to him, and um, he somehow managed to, to evade the police for a very long time. So I think maybe it's sort of selective limping. So he's sort of limping, and then he sort of start running, and then kind of limp again, things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, not a bad ending to it. So eventually the sixth death is him. Yes, in the back of uh, in the back of a, a garbage truck, which is actually quite a pretty gory way to go, actually. Although it does kind of make you think what he was trying to do, because I suppose maybe he was just trying to sort of catch a bit of a lift, so he didn't need to run anymore. But he did it <laughs> in the back of a garbage truck, and obviously he got crushed and you yeah. know. <laughs> he picked the wrong. He bits. picked the wrong place, probably because of that awkward limp. He was hitching a ride, but yeah. It's a pretty, pretty grim way to go. <laughs> um. So, uh, yeah. So, and that's that's all the deaths, really, isn't it? Yeah. And um, I just noted down as well the so the title. Oh, oh no. That so yeah. There's like a lack of of credits at the beginning and then at the end. Did you notice that? Yeah. It's just sort of blood feast. What appears to be written in like a child's sort of finger drawing. Yeah, like like on a weird green screen, and you can see like shadows moving over it. So it's done like quite sort of ropely, <laughs> ropely thrown together, which yeah. again has a certain kind of charm to it. But it did make me laugh at like how cheaply done it is. And you've got like um, what I thought was a really awful score as well. So for the first half of the film, all you hear is just this tribal drum. It's just bum, 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 bum. Bum over and over and over again, and eventually you go. <laughs> just that. Yeah. That's the score. Very sim- very simply done. It's again. It's kind of exactly what I expected, and it is a little bit annoying, but it fits <laughs> with what they're doing. Like it's very straightforward. It does the job. Same as the credits, the opening and closing credits. So it's like. Blood Feast at the beginning, written in red post paint, and then probably the end or something. I don't know, something obvious at the end. Um, but yeah, it's exactly what you would expect, but nothing elaborate. Like, it's not going to win any awards. Mm, no, no. And no, I, I agree. I mean, in terms of how I feel about it, I say I've seen it three times, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the acting is not great. I have seen worse acting, admittedly, <laughs> as scary as that sounds. Um, the acting's not great, but it's quite efficiently done. It's kind of fun. It's not mean spirited or sleazy or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I can see it's got a certain charm to it. As I say, as bits of it are too silly, like the fact that 
all anyone ever talks about are the murders. They don't have anything else going on in their lives. They must have really boring lives to the point where all they can talk about is, hmm, I wonder who's doing all these murders. And everyone talks in that sort of 60s soap opera kind of way. <laughs> Which is, yeah, kind of why I like it. And I would recommend this film because I think although it is bad good, that it, it's interesting to watch. And I liked it. I did like it. I thought it was fun. So... Would it uh, has it interested you in seeing any of uh, Herschel Gordon Lewis's other films? Yeah, actually, yeah, um, and I believe that there was a sequel to this it was in two thousand two, which is a lot later. Yeah, so Lewis did in fact direct a sequel, which I haven't seen, and I'm assuming you haven't seen either. It's a Blood Feast Two: All You Can Eat. Yeah, just for the title, I think I'd quite like to watch that. Sounds like a, be- like a buffet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And um, as with all films that have any kind of name value, um, this has actually been remade. It was remade last year. It was shown at Fright Fest, although I haven't seen it. Um, and I don't believe it's kind of appeared anywhere sort of on video on demand. I can't imagine it getting released in cinemas. So, yeah, so at some point we will have to check out the remake and see how it stacks up against the original. Um However, the key question, as we always cover on these uh, shows, is should this have been a video nasty? Um, Not anymore. It's too ridiculous and um, not realistic enough for me. So I'd say no. What about, what do you think? I I would also say no. I suppose back then, yeah, in 1963, this would have been very shocking. But nowadays, no, it's sort of very silly and we can kind of laugh at it. And, you know, (laughs) and. Well, I mean, fuck, some of the films we're going to talk about on this list, way, way more nihilistic than Blood Feast. So how this was even prosecuted, I have no idea. That fact itself, I find very laughable. Did you, so, did you find the whipping scene offensive or do you see how that would have been offensive then? Uh, no, <laughs> no, believe it or not, I don't see how the whipping scene would have been offensive. Because you've got to bear in mind, this is in the mid 80s, all this was going on. So that film would have been 20 years old. Yeah, it's a bit far-fetched, isn't it? (laughs) And on that note, um, if you do want to buy Blood Feast, um, it's actually not available by itself, although currently it is actually available as part of a Herschel Gordon Lewis box set available from, yes, those guys again, Arrow, uh, and it was also available from Tartan Video, though I believe Tartan Video don't exist anymore, which is a shame because I actually bought a, uh, a lot of DVDs that they brought out over the years particularly japanese films um yeah, me so too. Yeah. yeah so if you want to check out blood feast by all means that's how you would do it so um we've had one film where we've had um, a killer killing people um, for an egyptian god and we now have a killer who kills women for an aztec god in Mardi Gras Massacre, which some people believe is a remake of Blood Feast, although I don't think that that's really true. What do you think about that? Yeah, I can see where people got the idea from, that it does seem like thematically it's based on that. Um, I don't think it's a remake. Maybe it inspired it, or maybe it was partially coincidental, but I definitely see where the comparison comes from. And you've got to love this film, if only for the title. Like, I like the title. Yes, this is Mardi Gras Massacre, and it's directed by Jack Weiss. So, um, yeah, Rhea, take us away on the synopsis. Okay, so it's a 1978 film. Um, If you check out what the um, cover or poster artwork looks like, it's quite cool, very colourful, ties in with the Mardi Gras. I like that about as well. And the synopsis is... Um, police trying to capture somebody who is committing ritual ritualistic murders of women during the Mardi Gras in New Orleans. So, uh, what did you think about this one? Um, well, I thought it was ridiculously over the top. Um, I thought it was quite fun. It had very funny, sort of smooth music and tries to be very sexy and kind of weird but comes across as uh, again bad good bad good film yeah so this film has a very low budget um at least it looks like it has a very low budget i imagine the budget for this film must have been about 17 pounds um because the effects in it are very 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 cheap looking and even the film itself it's just the way it's shot looks very cheap so for example we have uh, characters just walking off camera and then walking back on again um at three points in the film we have three of the worst fights that i've ever seen in any film ever um, (laughs) 
particularly one fight where uh, John, who's the, the killer, is attacked by um, the um, one of the prostitutes he picks up. Her pimp tries to attack him, and it, the pimp just gets the absolute shit beaten out of him. But just the way it's done is just the absolutely most ridiculous, worst fight scene ever. Yeah, I think, like, tying back in with Blood Feast, similarities is, like, the the murderer and lead character um, keeps you engaged by just being ridiculously poor with the acting, but also the sort of delivery of the lines and the way that he looks. Like, in a similar sense to what we've just talked about, it did keep me interested because it was so bad that I needed to watch it. And just again with like with this with the music that goes with this, it's just like some kind of maybe like dodgy retro sort of lounge music meets porno. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's just so yeah, bad. yeah. So um, basically, f- a few things that kind of are of note in this film is one, as Rhea said, there's an overabundance of very funky disco music in this film. Like every other scene, it seems to have this really bom ba bom 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 ba bom 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 It's like very, very funky kind of, as I say, lots of bass, like kind of disco music for like at least half the film, which is so bizarre. Like every bar in New Orleans has this funky disco music going on, which did become very irritating after a while, although some of the songs, I've got to admit, were very catchy. And the film is just like laden with prostitutes, showgirls, strippers and dancers all the way through. So again, like I didn't have an opportunity to get bored, even though it's quite a bad film, um, because there's always something to look at, some kind of dodgy music going on or, you know, murder. And it's just like he's got a bit of a, even though he's he's um, sort of perpetrating these rituals, leading to the killings, they get quite excited about it because they think that it's going to be some kind of, like, um, some something kinky that he's going to do, and they get quite excited about it. So it's quite weird because you know that, like, there's, like, their doom's impending. Um, but he sort of comes out in this, like, weird-looking outfit. They get quite excited about it. There's a lot of nudity. And then it ends up being very unfortunate. But for that for that moment in time, they're sort of not sure what's going to happen. And it's quite sort of funny but weird at the same time. Yeah, there's a sort of very surreal kind of edge to this film, albeit whether that's intentional or not. Now, I don't believe it is intentional whatsoever. There are certain things about the film that just give it a very odd, as I say, surreal overtone. Like, for example, um, one of the things that definitely is surreal is the performance of the killer. So the killer's name is John, and he's played by William Mezzo. And the way this guy talks, so we talked about Fouad Ramsey's talking in a very weird sort of sinister way. This guy even tops that. Um, because just everything he says sounds sinister, even when he's just talking normally. So um, you've got to love, like, one of his first lines when he, uh, in the film, is he's talking, he's trying to buy a lady to uh, spend the night with, which is really easy in New Orleans, from what I can see. (laughs) And uh, what he says, and this is sort of an indication of how he talks for the whole film, is, tell me, of all the ladies in this bar tonight, which one do you think is the most... evil (laughs) (laughs) amazing just that level of like pauses between every other word that he says it's just unbelievable nailed it and they point him straight to the most evil lady in the bar which is like you know that that's how i like to rock it when i'm in a bar i'm just sort of like that's my angle for uh so you actually (laughs) so you would definitely take first prize in any evil contest yeah i love that line as well and i was like yeah that's me (laughs) (laughs) I'll have to bear this in mind for future reference. Um, So after they have this wonderful discussion where indeed she does say that she is probably taking the first prize in any evil contest, not just a evil contest, any evil contest, evil contests all around the world. Yeah, Um, she quite proudly proclaims that, which again, I found really funny. And it's like, well, she's the obvious choice for him. He takes her straight home with him. Well, hey, there we go. And that's exactly what she does. So he takes her back to his uh, apartment with its very gaudy sort of 70s or maybe 80s sort of decor. Um, which I thought was quite funny, and then takes her into his special room with a curtain, a red curtain, and a sacrificial altar. And at no point do they question why they're having to lie on this sacrificial altar and have their limbs tied up. In fact, she gets really excited about it, which again is like ironic, considering you know what's going to happen, but they don't know. 
So it's quite a weird watch because she gets quite excited about this. And he goes off to get changed for it into his ritual costume, which is just ridiculous And when he comes out. And it just adds to the whole hilarity of this. Plus, like, when he gets a bit psychotic when he's about to perform the ritual, you get these sort of whooshy space sounds going on. Yeah, that's all the score seems to be during those scenes. It's sort of, as you say, whooshy space noises. That's a very apt description of them. I think it's like the insanity in his head is like how I depicted that. But yeah, she gets quite excited about this and she says, Oh, uh, I don't know um, who should be paying who here. Perhaps I should be paying you for this service, <laughs> oh, which I God. thought was brilliant. <laughs> so, yeah, you've got to yeah. see. He comes out in this sort of mask and gold mask and suit, which is probably quite apt for the Mardi Gras and... She doesn't seem to think that's unusual and she's quite enjoying having her arms and legs tied up. And Q, we have like quite a quite a gory death. The effects are quite good and I was impressed. What did you think? Um I wasn't quite as impressed with the gore as as you were. Um I did kind of think that when he was cutting them on the hands and on the feet, that part looked okay. However, when he was sort of cutting their body and like taking out their their insides or their heart whatever it was they're supposed to be it was clearly like a fake torso yeah. even when he's rubbing oil on them it's also a fake torso which i thought was very odd oh really it looked fake to me the whole time it's just like hang on that body looks fake why are they doing that why are they rubbing they, were these women not willing to do close-ups of their breasts or something well probably not i would imagine that if they could get out of doing that they might have opted out of it because it's probably quite uncomfortable um but i don't know like i think for the sake of filming they should have done it realistically i didn't i didn't think that the torso looked too fake during the cutting part i I thought that was quite impressive but bear in mind i just watched blood feast so this is a massive step up effects wise from that yes (laughs) well (laughs) that's arguable (laughs) um but yeah, um, I did find the killings and the murder indeed himself to be the most exciting part of the film because the rest of the film um, is really awful. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we have uh, another, not as inept as the uh, policeman from Blood Feast, but we have um, two sort of slightly inept policemen. Uh, one is called Sergeant Frank Hebert, and he enters into a relationship with one of the prostitutes who's called Sherry. Yeah. And they have this really, really awful, very cringeworthy sort of, uh, you know, we have all these scenes of them talking. There's a scene where they talk in a restaurant and a fight almost breaks out on the table next to them, which, again, is one of the worst fights I've ever seen in my life. Um, at one point, a woman looked as if she was going to bottle the policeman and it looks as if she could barely lift the bottle as if she was going to fall over. <laughs> so, again, it looked absolutely ridiculous. And then you have this really, really, oh my God, such cringeworthy montage of them sort of clearly going on dates with each other <laughs> and like all around New Orleans, or at least it's supposed to be New Orleans anyway. And like, oh. Yeah, it's very cheesy sort of lounge music where she's like, oh, hey, so are you going to uh, pick up the bill for dinner then? And things like that. <laughs> it's just like, oh, God. I owe you one. Yeah, and then um, and somewhere spicing with that is like when, when they talk to the other detective or somebody, the other policeman, um, he says something like, oh, someone crazy is running around cutting up broads. <laughs> just made me laugh. Like He says something about like he compares it to meat or something. I can't quite remember the line. Do you remember that part? Mm, I remember the chief going a bit crazy at the policeman and they're talking about how all these people have called him, including the Hotel Association, about losing money over Mardi Gras. So it's like Jaws. So that, they kind of stole that idea from Jaws that all these people are like really upset. They're like, this killer's going around because it's going to cost them money. So you've got to find this killer now. <laughs> yeah. But it is, it is proper cringy in the middle. But like I say, I didn't have an opportunity to get bored because there are too many sort of like strippers and showgirls and cheesy parts that do make you laugh. Sort of mixed in with the actual serious parts of the weird killer with his little sex dungeon <laughs> ritual table, uh, which is yes. all quite interesting. Although, um, unfortunately, um, as entertaining as our our killer is, um, unfortunately, all his murders are basically exactly the same in that he will go to a bar, speak to someone about sort of picking up a lady because he has lots of money and he's willing to pay for it. And they're all like, yeah, that's awesome. Let me find you a girl. And the girl's like, I don't really want to do this. And their pimp or their pusher will be like, no, you have to. And then 
they'll go back and he'll be sort of using his sinister voice and then yeah they end up dying um although the most entertaining one of those kind of deaths was where um he goes to um a, one of the bars i believe it's the third death and he talks to this very very random um very sort of funky sort of black pimp pusher and i didn't know if it was a man or a woman <laughs> yeah i was a bit confused by that as well <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And um, he's speaking in like jive talk. <laughs> and um, yeah, and the name of the uh, name of the pimp is Catfish, which again, I thought was absolutely hilarious. So like, I'm not Catfish. I can't go and see this guy. <laughs> Amazing. What a name. And then after that is when we have uh, what's my favorite scene in the whole film, where um, our killer orders Chinese food on the phone. And if you thought he sounded sinister, sort of wanting to uh, see a woman who is particularly evil, you should see how he sounds ordering Chinese food. So um, <laughs> it would sound something like this. This is 620 Madison Street, apartment four. I would like you to deliver an order of shrimp rolls, lobster Cantonese, jia su ding, and a fortune cookie. <laughs> I love that part. My favourite line by the killer was was this one. Scream all you want. The room is soundproof. (laughs) (laughs) It's so romantic, you know. Go back to a guy's place and no one can hear you. I want to know what Jasu Ding is now. Yeah, I I thought that as well. What the the heck is that? But yeah. What the hell is that? And lobster Cantonese. It's like, okay, sounds kind of nice. What's he putting inside that fortune cookie? You will die a (laughs) a ritualistic death in my sex dungeon. Hmm. Hmm. So I've got, um, the, I've got the body count, but yeah, like you say, referencing one of our previous shows when we did Drill a Killer and the list was pretty much every death with the same description, I've kind of replicated that here, but the grand total is only three, so I was quite surprised. Yeah, because this, um, I mean, it's not a long film, but it's still about an 80 minute long film. And I guess how they padded out the plot is with the relationship between Sherry and the policeman. Which is absolutely awful. <laughs> yeah, and with a with a lot of blood and nudity, and one particularly impressive interpretive dance scene where he actually he almost bottles out of killing her. Um. <laughs> mm. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I know which scene you're talking about now. Yes, um, it was very interesting because the first thing I thought is, oh, hang on, she was naked a second ago. Where'd she get all these panties from? Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, I can dance. Look, show me. I'll show you. And then she just does this random dance for about two minutes. Yeah, it's this very sort of, uh, she's just taken by the moment and starts dancing all around the ritual table and everything, and it's very distracting for him, and it's quite funny. It's quite distracting for me as well, in fairness. Yeah, <laughs> I can not stop laughing, I'm just like, okay, so you're going, you're quite taken by the medium of dance at this moment, not knowing that he's about to kill you, and he's like, you should just go now, and then she insists on staying. <laughs> Yes, because he doesn't actually want to kill her because she's only like 19 and he's like, well, she's not quite as evil as uh, the kind of women that I normally see. So he almost lets her go. But because she's a complete idiot, she was like, no, I really want to stay and have sex with you, really strange man, on your sacrificial altar. Yeah. Again, she's excited by the little sex dungeon that he's prepared in his costume. So, you know. Mm. This is giving me ideas. He's a chick magnet, isn't he? I mean, come on. Well, exactly. I mean, clearly, like, he has a, a certain way with the ladies. It's just putting pauses and speaking in a really, like, deep, sinister manner and having a uh, Aztec sacrificial sort of sex altar. Yeah, and she's, re- she's really impressed when he orders that Chinese where she's like, oh, they don't, people don't normally do this for me. It's like... <laughs> well, there you go. There's a reason why. <laughs> Dinner, ritualistic sacrifice, you know, yeah, evening, exactly. evening well done. <laughs> um, I've, one thing I did find funny about this film, and it must be one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest movie mistakes or plot, yeah, one of the biggest plot holes that I've ever seen in a film, is at the very start of the film where the killer is looking for a girl who is particularly evil. He talks to two prostitutes, one of whom is Sherry, and then at the end of the film, uh, when it actually is Mardi Gras, our killer um, he asks for three women. Uh, to meet up with him and go back to his place. And he's willing to pay a lot of money for this. And one of those women is Sherry. And Sherry does not remember seeing this guy. <laughs> Which, if you met this man in real life, you would not forget this guy. 
<laughs> so how does she not remember talking to this guy who she knows killed one of her friends? Well, because it's Mardi Gras week, so she's very busy. She probably sees a lot of men, and she's probably off her face because, you know, most people in those kind of bars would have been at that point. It's party week. Right, but it's this particular guy. I mean, I get what you're saying, and that has a certain amount of truth to it, but if you have a guy who talks like this and dresses in the way he does and has lots of money, then it's like... And he's killed your friend, who you remember seeing, speaking to your friend, when she disappeared. (laughs) Doesn't really make a lot of sense. Yeah, I'm sticking with my theory. She works in dark places, (laughs) nightclubs and bars and the like. You know, they didn't have Facebook back then. She couldn't look him up, so whatever. (laughs) Mm. Women are never wrong. (laughs) One thing I've learnt in my life. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, I've got got Death Count 3, prostitute, evil brunette, sacrificed, possibly gutted. Number two, prostitutes. Again, sensing a theme here. Heart ripped out. Number three, prostitute slash stripper. She was a bit more classy, I think. She was the dancer. Um, Has her heart cut out yet again. And then he he attempts the killing of the final three. And he doesn't quite pull it off, does he? Uh, No, because the killer, they speak to the uh, Chinese takeaway place that he ordered from with that amazing order and they speak to the delivery guy and he remembers him because he gave him a massive tip so there you go um basically be a massive cheapskate and you won't get caught by the police yeah that's clever actually i like that detail and then um, they try and catch him and the ending i'm not gonna lie and this is um (laughs) gonna be a common uh, theme on the next sort of on this show and the next show is that the ending did leave a little bit to be desired i'm not gonna lie (laughs) so um our killer who he he runs away he tries to escape out the back of his block of flats and he tries to escape gets in a car drives away the police chase after him one of the worst car chases i've ever seen in any film Because with a car chase, how you want to do is you kind of want to do like lots of cuts and you want to be close for most of it and you want to get sort of a sense of kind of what's going on in the car chase. Whereas this is kind of, he stood in one place and filmed and they didn't move and then they shot from another place quite far away and filmed the cars moving and you got no sense of like kinetic energy whatsoever from the scene at all. It was just really lazy and just a bit shit. (laughs) Yep, agreed with that. (laughs) Um, and then um, our killer, what he does is he tries to escape by driving a police car into a river off the edge of a pier, as you do. And then he, apparently they can't find his body. So maybe he's still out there somewhere. Although there's never been a Mardi Gras Massacre 2. So who knows? Maybe he's out there somewhere waiting for his sequel to come eventually. In So yeah, unconfirmed fourth death, so I can only total three on that. Um, Going back to Blood Feast, how we had the ropey poster paint um, sort of fake blood titles that were clearly sort of green screened in. This one just had kind of nothing. It was like a still screen. Yeah, the film just kind of, it kind of faded to black and there were not even any music over the end credits. It's just kind of... They, they just kind of happened and I was like oh okay <laughs> very strange it reminds me of those kind of old sort of Disney short you know short animation films where it's literally just the text in the beginning and it's so basic you come out with some amazing comparisons on this show <laughs> I'm like comparing this bloody yeah bloody bloodbath to like all oh, sweetness and light of Disney back in the 40s <laughs> shows so you how my had... mind works it's a good insight yes. Exactly. So we've had the Toolbox Murders uh, compared to Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Now we've got Mardi Gras Massacre compared to Disney shorts from the uh, 30s and 40s. <laughs> it's just like my, my DVD collection and film collection is literally like the darkest, goriest horror you can imagine juxtaposed next to um, Disney, Pixar and animation. <laughs> it's pretty much me in a nutshell. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Um, so, um, I can already tell you, uh, my answer is that no, this should not have been a video nasty, <laughs> um, due to the, uh, overall sort of cheap and sort of ineptness of the film, even with its slight kind of surreal edge, even with the nudity, even with the, uh, mutilation. Um, do you agree with that? I shouldn't have been a video nasty. Um, more, it, it would be more so than Blood Feast because I felt like the premise of the prostitutes and the kind of the the dungeon and everything was a little bit sort of on the cusp of being, you know, really quite offensive. 
but today nobody would bat an eyelid, so I'm going to say no, I don't think it should have been banned. So there you go. Um, not a video nasty. Um, if you are in the UK and you uh, want to check this one out yourself and buy it on DVD, you unfortunately cannot do that because it's never been released in the UK. So uh, you will have to uh, seek alternative methods of uh, finding that one. Well, that's, that's rare. I guess they're uh, not hoping to make much money out of that then. No, I mean, it apparently didn't make a lot of money at the time. And this is one of those films where you kind of think that, like, if it was never, you know, a video nasty, it would have probably just disappeared into obscurity and never would have been heard of again. It's just because it's on this list, it's just keeping it out there. And, you know, it's for people like us who are sort of total video nasties completists, uh, hence why we're doing these series of shows, to um, watch for ourselves, really. Yeah, I found it quite entertaining, so I would recommend that people do watch it, but do obviously um, bear in mind that it is kind of a bad, good movie. I've just noticed what the tagline is on some of the um, posters that I've seen online, um, and I think this is brilliant. Life is all about sacrifices. <laughs> Amazing. Very, very true. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Especially in terms of this film. Yeah. Um, so that is Mardi Gras Massacre, as I said. Um, it's kind of one of these sort of quite cheesy sort of bad horror movies that you get quite a lot of, particularly in the 70s and the 80s. Um, so if you want to check, well, it's not that long. Um, the killer is quite hilarious. Um, so, yeah, if you like your nudity, um, then you might want to check that one out. So, um, the last film that we're going to talk about on the show today is Evil Speak, which is directed by Eric Weston. Um, now, this also has the alternative title of Evil Speaks, and <laughs> amazingly, and this is very, very sort of matter of fact, Computer Murder. <laughs> Brilliant. I like that. Just, yeah, it's less like, what is the film about? It's a man who murders people using a computer. So, there you go. Um, so... Um, this is actually quite an infamous little video nasty, and this is infamous for a few different reasons, one of which is because um, Anton LaVey, who is the head of the Church of Satan, has actually recommended to uh, anyone who is interested in Satanism or wants to be a Satanist to watch this film. <laughs> Brilliant. That sounds that's very cool. So what more could you ask? You have Anton's seal of approval there. Um, and this also is one of the first starring roles um, in the, the main character, Stanley Cooper Smith. Um, it's played by Clint Howard, who is the younger brother of director Ron Howard. And um, Clint is, uh, he's kind of one of these people, if you watch enough sort of 80s, 90s movies, he, he will have appeared in some of them. He's one of those that guy actors that they talk about. Um, so he, he has appeared in his brother's movies, uh, most notably Apollo 13 and Frost Nixon. Not normally in big roles, but he is normally there. Um, but he has also appeared in such cinematic masterpieces as Ice Cream Man. <laughs> um, I love that, actually. <laughs> Um, House of the Dead by Uwe Boll, which I've seen and is a absolute fucking piece of shit. Um, Barb Wire, starring Pamela Anderson, and um, that Christmas classic starring Hulk Hogan, Santa with Muscles. Oh, this is all brilliant stuff. We should watch all of these. I especially recommend Ice Cream Man because it's really bad and it appears to be uh, sponsored by Converse because all the way through you just see close-ups of Converse trainers. So there you go. If you uh, watch a bad 80s movie, Clint Howard will probably be in it at some point. Although that is not necessarily an indication that he's a bad actor himself. I actually think he uh, is very good in this film. Um, but yeah, he does appear in the, all, a lot of those kind of films, as he said. So um, what is the synopsis of this one? As if computer murder wasn't obvious enough. <laughs> Yeah, that's a pretty straightforward description there, but I'll go into some more detail on the synopsis. So this is a 1981 film, and the basic synopsis is an orphan, bullied, outcast military cadet, i.e. Cooper Smith, taps into a way to summon demons, and he casts spells onto his tormentors via the means of computer. Yes, so um, this is actually quite an interesting film in many ways. I actually quite like this one. Um, yeah, me to too. Me, I enjoyed it. It's very, very cool. Yeah, it's a cool little film. Um, it's definitely the best film that we're going to talk about on this show, <laughs> especially compared to Mardi Gras Massacre. Yeah, agreed, um, agreed. Um, to me, like this film, to me, came across as a bit of a cross between uh, Carrie and The Omen. 
And, um, well, with all the computers in it, because as you said, it's 1981 and computer technology is quite obviously not what it is now. Um, and the computer that he uses in the film is sort of closer to like a Commodore 64 or a ZX Spectrum. Yeah, so, yeah, it does look like that. It's so good. Yeah, it gives me so much nostalgia watching this film. So it's quite interesting that he invokes what is basically Satan just using this really, really cheap old computer. Yeah, and it's such a kind of 80s teen horror cliche movie, but at the same time, it's it's really fun and cool film to watch. Uh, I believe it's got quite the cult following, actually. Yeah. Um, now, as you said, it's very kind of, it's got a lot of 80s kind of horror movie cliches in it. So, for example, the, the, the main character, so Cooper Smith, he is bullied quite a lot. He's bullied by pretty much everyone. There's only two characters in the film who actually seem to like him, um, one of whom is a black cadet who I don't even think is given a name, but he's the one who's kind of like tries to get the bullies to stop picking on him. And um, the cook... <laughs> who is actually played by Luca Brasi from The Godfather, which I thought was awesome. That's cool. And um, our outcast military cadet, Cooper Smith, just gets called Cooper Dick like from the outset all the way through, which is a really lame joke, but it is kind of funny in the film. It did make me laugh. Um, so this one is slightly different from the other two films that we've talked about in that instead of having um, the killer just kill people from the outset um, in worship of their particular deity, um, it actually happens really only at the end. So it's more a case of like this character who's kind of, you know, has to go through all this shit basically and is kind of people don't really, they just bully him and they basically treat him like crap. And essentially, he, through finding, like, this old diary um, of this old Spanish priest called Esteban, who basically was excommunicated. So right at the start of the film, you have this really weird prologue where you've got this guy being excommunicated for worshipping the devil. And they do this satanic ritual involving decapitation of a woman, which is our first death. Yep. Quite a lot of decapitation happens in this film. Yeah, there's an unexpectedly high death count in this film, which I was not prepared for. Again, I think the special effects are pretty awesome in this. And it is very evil, like the connotations of um, Satanic and Esteban and the the levitation and decapitation and everything that goes on. There's a lot to see. Yes, exactly. Um, now, the plot, I mean, in terms of the actual characters themselves, um, we've got Cooper Smith, who, because he's the main character, obviously, they do in invest a lot of time in him. And he's played really well by Clint Howard. Um, the bullies aren't really given a lot of depth, but then again, they're just there to be dicks, and they are dicks, in fairness. So someone who has been bullied themselves, I always feel a bit kind of uneasy when I see films where characters are getting picked on and bullied especially in the way that cooper smith gets bullied in this film it's like they go really 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 far um yeah it's so. relent it's relentless as well it's to the point where it's just like he gets absolutely no relief of that and the the cliche of him being an orphan and them teasing him about his parents dying and stuff like that it's all just a it's so uncomfortable to watch but again it's so cliche like it does tick those sort of 80s teen horror movie boxes um, one thing that I actually found quite funny is, um, so Cooper Smith, for a lot of the film, he spends it sort of in the, the basement, I suppose, or the downstairs region of the church at the army base. And they have, like, in the church, they actually have a picture of Esteban, like, on the wall. And you think that, I thought, found that kind of weird, just because it's like, well, you've got this guy who was excommunicated for basically practicing satanic rituals, and you've got this picture of him on the wall of your church. He's there. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, I just found that quite amusing. Um, but I actually found like the interior of the church itself downstairs actually really creepy and really eerie. So sort of how he they had it shot like with the um, torches lit and fire and sort of because it's old and there's cobwebs everywhere and it's quite dark and it's quite eerie. I thought that was quite effective. Yeah, the setting of the whole film, in fact, is very dark, like the basement and the church and everything. And yeah, it's, it does make this a really interesting watch. Um, I enjoyed I enjoyed the aesthetics of the church and the satanic um, evil vibes that were going on. 
And uh, I suppose one of the reasons for that is the score itself, um, which I thought was very similar to the Omen sort of score. Lots of chanting, sort of sangri, minimus, like that kind of thing. Going on. <laughs> well, that's, that's the Omen that I did just then. But it was very similar to that. Yeah, brilliant. And it does really sort of add to that build up as well. And he's, like I say, he's getting relentlessly picked on. So you can kind of see it coming that he's going to break at some point and... He's helping. He's helping, getting help by conjuring these demons through his very eighties sort of. Cal- it's got that kind of classic sort of calculator sci-fi sort of font text on his computer screen, and it's all kind of green and black. You know, as exactly as you would expect, like so eighties and sort of like Back to the Future esque kind of retro cool. You know. Yeah, I did. I yeah, I agree. Like with the whole eighties sort of green font on the computer, I did like. I did find it very impressive that in the eighties he was able to basically take what is essentially a library computer and have it translate sort of ancient texts for him. And yeah, it, it was just. <laughs> it was. I, I got obviously it's a product of its time, but you've got basically what is essentially you know this evil kind of dead priest who is possessed an evil computer and can now kind of kill people. So, for example, um, the first death in the present day in the film is the death of Sarge, who is this sort of weird old man who sort of seems to live in the basement of the church. Yeah. So, yeah, you've got the woman decapitated at the beginning, then the second one is Sarge in the basement. And he has a couple of lines that made me laugh uh, before he dies, where it's like, he goes, tell me my ass. There's my fucking crowbar. <laughs> yeah, you don't take a man's crowbar, damn it. Yeah, and then he says, it. it's a good trick, you cocksucker. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, um, I'm going to show you how to make a little boy into a little girl and sort of threatens him. And that's how he, he comes to uh, be killed, unfortunately. Yes, exactly. So the computer, like in that way of horror films of this type, anyone who sort of threatens Cooper Smith, they sort of meet their doom. Uh, Welcome to your doom. Um, So basically uh, what happens in this case is um, uh, Sarge uh, gets killed by having his head turned 180 degrees, i.e. sort of Regan from The Exorcist. Although in this case, um, it's what would actually happen in real life if that happened and he dies instantly. Yeah, awesome. Pretty awesome ideas. I like the I like the evil ideas in this film. Although, without wanting to shit on the film too much, I'm not sure how that is actually supposed to work. <laughs> like, how is the computer sort of doing that, basically? Because it's not Cooper Smith, it's the computer. Yeah, it's like nowadays we would think about that and we'd be like, nah, that's not going to happen. Nah, but nah, nah, mate. Nah. But um, <laughs> yeah, like back then, they were all like, ooh, in the future, all this new technology will be developed that we don't know about and it's going to be able to do stuff like that. So, you know, just mm-hmm. like I say with Back to the Future, there was this whole kind of outlook of it all being so technologically advanced and they're just relying on what will happen not like what's current whereas i think we tend to be more realistic about it now yes so if you were trying to invoke satan nowadays you wouldn't use like a zx spectrum no (laughs) no you know ouija board pentagram something like that circle of salt but probably not my. don't mention ouija boards (laughs) probably probably not my commodore 64 (laughs) no exactly um, so then we have the second death, well, second death in the present day, shall we say, um, which is um, what you would have definitely in a film like this, where you have your essential to the plot shower scene, where you've got quite an attractive lady, not going to lie, um, she gets all her clothes off, and you see everything she has, that's something that doesn't happen in horror films nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> so <Not> often. at all. <laughs> So well, frequently in these films that we've discussed in the show have we seen lots of boobs, so... <laughs> yes. I thought it's really weird in that sort of the secretary... So she's the secretary to the colonel, who's one of the people who makes Cooper Smith's life very miserable. At one point he actually sort of gives him sort of... Uh, he hits him with a cane on the bum, <laughs> as you would do sort of if you were being punished back then, like you probably would at school. I'm not even sure why he did it. He just did it to be a dick. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so um, the secretary seals Cooper Smith's um, satanic book and for some reason is absolutely obsessed with trying to take the uh, the metal sort of symbol, satanic symbol off the front of the book. And this um, invokes some evil satanic pigs to um, get a bit sort of agitated. 
as you do if you are going to be satanic you you should pro- and you're going to have an animal kind of defend you um you're probably going to use pigs oh i love the the i think this is brilliant evil reference though because they're like these kind of big sort of almost they're like kind of black pigs and they're they're huge and they kind of they move quite fast and the thing is with like pigs as an evil reference i just thought that was really different but at the same time it's like in more sort of modern murder theories or films um people always get fed to the pigs to like dispose of their bodies because they eat bones as well so they eat everything apparently Mm. that's the reason so i thought that was like a really cool idea to have those kind of running in and then they like eat her in the shower so i thought that was pretty fucked up and evil it pleased me very much (laughs) (laughs) well there you go so if you want to please Rhea, that's how you do it that's a cool part of the plot what can i say So anyway, so she's having a shower, as you do in films of this nature, and uh, the pigs uh, manage to find where she lives and run in and basically kill her and eat her, uh, which is, you know, pretty, uh, let's say, very different sort of death in a a horror film. I haven't seen, (laughs) I never thought I'd ever see a naked woman killed by evil satanic pigs in a shower before. (laughs) It's just genius, isn't it? And then um, after that, we have um, more bullying. Uh, lots of bullying takes place in this film. And then you have kind of... Uh, so at one point in the film, uh, Cooper Smith, uh, which is very random in a way, he gets given a puppy to look after. And it was a very cute puppy, uh, I have to be honest. Um, but he is given this to look after and he keeps it downstairs with him in the church. And any film like this where you have a small animal, you know it's probably going to meet a sort of very grisly end at some point and this film is no exception to that oh poor dog it's poor little dog so it gets uh yeah it gets killed now it's quite interesting that at one point like uh the uh the computer the evil satanic computer it's looking for what it calls a blood consecrated host and it needs this to complete its data um, however, as we find out, even though it's uh, it needs blood, it's very specifically human blood, not animal blood. So the dog actually gets killed for no reason. Ah, uh, this happens so frequently in horror. It had to had to be done. <laughs> it had to be done. Yes, exactly. Um, um, so at this point, as I said, the dog gets killed, and is one of uh, Cooper Smith's only friend. So naturally, this is the point, and we're kind of about 15 minutes out from the end of the film at this point. So you kind of know that sort of there's all these people who are still alive. Um, however, they're not alive for much longer, and we get a lot of deaths in, say, in the last 15 minutes of the film. <laughs> yeah, so I've kind of totaled it up at, I think, like, we could count 10. But I've sort of tried, I did a bit of research, and other people online, different reviews are saying... 12 so it's it's either 10 or 12 plus the dog so potentially 13 deaths but it's all a little hazy at the end because everything just happens all at once so there's um one of the teachers gets his heart ripped out and then there's the reverend and then the four bullies and the coach and then beyond that i'm sure there are probably a couple of others but it's just people in the church generally i'm not too sure on that yeah, so essentially what happens in the film is they're about to play a really important football match and they have this meeting in the in the church and the reverend's basically telling them about the evils of Satan <laughs> as you've got this picture of Esteban in the background, which I thought was absolutely hilarious. Um, so they're all in the same place at the same time, which is quite useful if you want to kill a lot of people all at once. And I'm not going to lie, I thought the last sort of 10 or 15 minutes of the film were really fucking cool. Yeah, so cool. It was yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, that really sold it to me. There's like burning church, and he's kind of levitating up off the floor, and the music's pretty cool, and it's all very intense and fast moving. Um, I liked it. I thought it was really cool. Yes, exactly. So we have lots of decapitations, people being eaten by pigs, um, people burning to death. Yeah, Burn, and, burning uh, church in general is very dramatic, and the effects mm. are pretty cool. Exactly. I'm sure that was the Norwegian's excuse in the 90s. Uh, um, yeah, so as you said, like lots of people die in a very short space of time. Um, it's really cool. So you've got uh, Cooper Smith, he's levitating in midair and he has a giant sword which he goes around decapitating people with. Um, really, really awesome. Love it. Love the way it's shot. Love the way it's done. Obviously, you've got all that build up, all that kind of bullying, hazing all that shit, basically, that he has to go through, and he finally gets his revenge. 
And then the ending, I thought, was just a bit of a damp squib, really, unfortunately. It's kind of spoilt things. It's almost as if they, like, kind of didn't really know what to do, and they just kind of had a bit of a cop-out ending. Well, explain what you think is the cop-out part, because there was one part that I liked at the end that I'll explain. Well, so basically he's killed everyone. So basically everyone in the film is dead, bar the cook and the black guy who are helping him. So literally all the bullies are dead, the coach is dead, colonel's dead, uh, reverend's dead, all the teachers are dead, a lot of the other students are dead. And then there's just this text that comes up on the screen that basically said that, you know, Cooper Smith, he was the sole survivor of this great accident and he's now in an asylum. Yeah, he goes into a (laughs) mental institute, doesn't he? Yes, so he's apparently been taken to a mental institute, but then the literal ending of the film is um, instead of it being Esteban in the machine, it's now Cooper Smith, he's in the machine, and you get this sort of 80s sort of Tron sort of graphic of like... (laughs) Um, Clint Howard's face sort of appear sort of on the computer screen which I thought was sort of it was quite cool not gonna lie but I just again like with endings it's just I don't know it's just I felt it was just very abrupt we got kind of everything we wanted and there was no kind of epilogue it just sort of ended yeah. like they ran out of money basically well I partially agree with you but I also disagree with you because I thought it was pretty cool <laughs> yeah cause police like... are coming for you by the way <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, that's <laughs> so, all right. Bit of background noise there. Um, yeah, I partially agree with you, but I also disagree with you in the classic style of our show because I thought it was really cool. I see what you mean about it being like kind of a bit abrupt, but I loved all that build up, like how he got his revenge, and that part where it explains that he goes into a men- mental institution. It's so like just kind of an easy way to wrap it up, but it also implied that it. It was one of those ways of implying that it was maybe based on truth, where they sort of give the little story at the end of what might have happened. And then obviously you get that that graphic coming back. But the bit that I loved at the end was after the heart had been ripped out and it's still quite fresh in your mind, there's like a heartbeat at the end. So that could be implying that it's coming from the computer and that he's like living it on inside that computer, like as a sort of demon spirit. Or it could be the heart, that got ripped out just kind of carrying on from that scene so i thought that was really creepy and pretty cool so i i loved that i thought it was an, an awesome ending um yeah i i take your point on board i i just found it to be a bit abrupt um because normally what ha- like in carrie for example is that spoiler for anyone who's not seen carrie by the way but obviously carrie white dies at the end like the house that her and her mother live in collapses on top of her and then you've got the great kind of fake out scene at the end that everyone talks about that friday the 13th stole with the hand coming out of the ground the massive jump scare right at the end um i don't know i you could have done something like that because the thing is it's just like yes he got his revenge and yes that's you're vindicated and it's great and then it's like so now what and they didn't know i don't think they kind of probably knew what to do which is why maybe they ended it like that but i don't know i guess we will have to agree to disagree on that one yeah uh that that's the uh, that's the way that we operate here on the lament configuration that's that's what makes it interesting oh, exactly um you can't have everyone agreeing on everything otherwise the listeners would get bored exactly exactly so um we've come to the end of our show can you believe it all that time has gone so quickly so thank you very much everyone for listening i hope you've enjoyed the show um i want to thank everyone who's listened to all our previous shows um keep on doing so please subscribe to us on itunes on our itunes page and um, please subscribe to us on our brand new youtube page because a lot of people out there wanted who don't have itunes who hate apple um basically they wanted somewhere that they could listen to our show so we have listened and we now have our own dedicated YouTube channel, which is at the Lament Configuration Podcast. And our Facebook page is also uh, the Lament Configuration Podcast. If you are checking us out on Facebook, all our updates are on there. And we're also on Twitter at Lament Horror. That's at Lament Horror. Um, please follow us on there. Yeah, I will be posting more facts and interaction on social media. Please do feel free to tweet us any feedback, any requests. If I got the body count wrong, please do feel free to message us on Facebook or Twitter to let us know. Um, I've been reoffend alternative model, also available on Facebook on my public page, reoffend, and on Twitter and Instagram as rea underscore fend. Um, I've been Body Count Girl and the, the show has been awesome. I've thoroughly enjoyed all three films, especially the evil satanic pigs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Exactly. You're an evil satanic pig girl. Yes. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> you know I didn't mean it in that way. So complimentary. Uh, yeah, exactly. so until the next time, looking forward to it. And on that note, um, we're going to wish you all a very, very good day. And um, we will see you again next time. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.